Thank you for joining us. It, and we're going to be uh, talking about that uh, this evening and working our way through it. Um, uh, Michael is based here in, at Hillsdale College. He is our uh, lecturer and research fellow for the college here in Washington, D.C., where he teaches undergraduates and will be teaching in our graduate school of government. We're getting ready to start here very soon. Uh, before that, he was a deputy assistant to uh, the President of the United States, uh, working on national security and he previously had other political and corporate roles. Uh, he's also a senior fellow with the Claremont Institute, our good friends out in California. Uh, his works have appeared in the Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, numerous other places, and he is a regular on Fox. Um, the original uh, essay, The Flight 93 Election, ap appeared in the Claremont Review of Books on September 5th, 2016. Uh, this book we have here is actually made of, th of three essays, that original essay, uh, a second essay which also appeared after the first, uh, Replying to Critics, and a, a new essay, a long essay, The Restatement on Flight 93, uh, excuse me, a, uh, a new uh, essay which is a pre-statement, a, a prequel if you will, although I add that it's a good prequel, not like the Phantom Mentis, uh, for all those Star Wars fans. Um, so what I'd like to do is talk about all of those because they're all interesting and, they're in, 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 especially interesting, and spend a lot of time on the, uh, the pre-statement, the additional uh, work he's done, uh, laying out his uh, opening to set up, that, that up. But I'd like to first talk about the, fl the original Flight 93 election essay. And uh, Michael, begin by welcoming you here, but also um, uh, tell us about, the, there's a lot of great backstory to that original essay. Right, it, it, it goes way back in a sense that uh, I think like every, well, I'll speak only for myself. When Donald Trump announced that he was running for president in June of 2015, I did not take it seriously because it was the third time he was running. In both of the previous two occasions, he never got into a primary. He never was around when a single vote was cast. He seemed to be around in the early stages, made a lot of noise, made his point and ducked out, and the purpose seemed to be publicity. So I didn't take it at all seriously. And he kept saying publicly, you know, no, I'm in it for real this time. I'm here to win, and I have an agenda, and you need to take it seriously. And as the months wore on and I listened, I thought, all right, I'll try to take it seriously. And I began to think, actually, your program, your platform makes more sense to me, is more appealing to me than the other in the field. And so, now that's, I have to say, that was an unorthodox position, that's the nice way to put it. But also with somebody from sort of my background, having worked for a lot of conventional, or at least more conventional Republicans, with a, you know, somebody from uh, a more traditional conservative background, I think mean, it's safe to say Matt and I had basically the same education. Um, this was not a popular position, not merely among mainstream Republicans, but among people who were trained the way we were trained. So I asked for permission, or I asked if the, Claremont Review of Books, which was my sort of home base. I was in the corporate world at the time, but I wrote for the Claremont Review once or twice a year. I asked if they would be interested in a piece defending Trump you know, as the best Republican candidate. And this was before Iowa, before any vote was cast. And they said, oh, we'd love to have that. And so I wrote it, spent a lot of time on it, sent it to many uh, friends and so on for critique that I went through and sent it in. Usually the CRB, when they get, or anybody, usually when they get something, they'll tell you pretty quick, no or yes. Uh, this took about three weeks, and the answer was no. <laughs> and I said, well, in a way, you commissioned this. So, uh, long story, I was ticked off. And somebody who I didn't know particularly well, but I knew a little bit, had written a great piece for the Weekly Standard, now defunct, but uh, in September of 2015, called Traitor to His Class. It was an analysis of Trump. I, I, it grabbed my attention, and it turns out that we had some mutual friends in common. Then he wrote a follow-up piece um, also for the standard on managerialism and how it explains Trump, and it was a very serious takeout, uh, teeing off of the famous James Burnham book from, I can't remember the date, but sometime in the 50s, 50s. called The Managerial Revolution, and the standard turned that down. I just happened to be at a dinner, a very small dinner with this guy, and I'm complaining that you know my friends turned down my piece, and he's saying, yeah, well, my friends turned down my piece, and that's in the media terrible. And so our answer, his answer really, I didn't think he was serious, was well, we're just gonna start a blog and, and take them all down. And so he started it. I went home that night thinking, that was a fun dinner. Now I have to get up and go back to my real life. 
And instead, I woke up, I checked my computer before I leave the house, and it says, you have been invited to contribute to the Journal of American Greatness. What does that mean? He had started, he had stayed up all night and he'd set up the blog and he gave me the keys and a few of us. And he's like, we're gonna actually do this. Okay. So we made the anchor two pieces of the Journal of American Greatness, my rejected thing and his rejected thing. <laughs> and then we wish took off from there. And it took a while. People started to notice it. Uh, Ken Masugi, who was supposed to be here, maybe yep. he'll still be here. Ken's there. Oh, Ken is there. Ken was one of the very first to notice it and started to write about it. Um, the power line guys found it, started writing about it. But then what really happened, in June of 2016, we started this in February of 2016, Peggy Noonan wrote a whole column about it in the Wall Street Journal, which caused some of us, not so much me, I'm just saying, but some of us, to freak out and think, this has gone too far. And so the, the plug was pulled. And I thought, all right, well, that's that. I'll, I won't and, do this anymore. But, but, but even there, you were also writing under a pseudonym. Yeah, all, all of that was pseudonym. All we, we, each, we, each, we, each choo, we each chose a Roman name. Um, and, and by the way, let me just say, I'm not going to go into this in any detail to now because it takes too long. But if you ever want to publish a book that will allow you 4,200 words to explain exactly why you chose the pseudonym you chose, you only can do it with Encounter Books. <laughs> Nobody else will let you get away with that. They did. So it's all there. Anyway, we all had a Roman name. Um, you know, mine was Decius or Decius. Uh, one of them was Plautus, in other words, you know, a comedian. One of them, who was particularly hard over on the question of the Iraq War, chose Lucullus, who was the Roman conqueror of Mesopotamia. So there's a backstory to each, to each one of the Roman names. So a couple of months go by, and I vowed I'm never going to do that again, because I kind of risked a lot, and it was stupid, and I got away with it, so I should move on. And whatever, for whatever reason, I decided, no, I can't move on. I've got to just say something else. Because I remember the CRB sent me a note saying, well, we're going to do all this election coverage. Do you want to write some election? And I said, yeah, I kind of would, but um, I also want to remain employed, so maybe I shouldn't. And then I just did it anyway. Um, I, I pointed this out when I was at the Manhattan Institute. I'll point it out here. I think it's, it should be recorded for posterity. That piece was written, I say in the book, in two days. What I don't add is it was written in Santa Cruz, California, which if any of you know, is one of the most left-wing hippie towns in the Western world, so I find that oddly appropriate. Anyway, I wrote it, and I gave it to my wife. And I said, what do you think? And by the way, you have veto over this because, you know, she relies on my income, and if something bad happens, then, you know, the bad would befall the family, not just me. And if you want me not to do this, I won't do it, and that's that. Don't worry about it. And she said, do it. Okay. So I sent it in, and I didn't really think anybody would care because, first of all, I had a pseudonym. Right? I read things, I think we all do. You look at the byline first. Oh, I know that guy, I like that guy, I'm gonna read that. If you, somebody that you either know, you think isn't that great, or you don't know who it is, you're much less likely to read it. If it's an obviously made up name, you're probably just gonna say, whatever. And, or you would recognize the name and go, oh, this is from the Journal of the American Greatness guy. Wow, I liked that. And then they'd read the piece and get disappointed. Although they use the extended. I did. Roman name. They made me do that for some reason. I don't know why. <laughs> the, full, anyway, the full Roman name. The full Roman name. I thought people who actually remember Jag would be really let down because they'd say, you didn't say anything you didn't already say on Jag. And the only reason I'm reading this is because I remember that name. And so I thought, this is, this is going to go nowhere. Nobody's going to care. And uh, well, <laughs> um, this came out on Labor Day, which was Monday. And nothing happened. And then Tuesday, and nothing happened. And on a Wednesday, I happened to be working from home through the firm's VPN. And um, I was in my little home office, the door closed, really working on work work. And, uh, doom, doom, and the door opens, and it's my wife. I don't know, yeah, you know what? It's about 10 after 12, 12, 15. She says, uh, do you want the good news or the bad news? I, say, I said, I always want the bad news first. So what is it? She said, Rush Limbaugh is reading it on the air right now. <laughs> What's the good news? It's preempted in New York by a Mets game. All right, that's something. And then I thought for a second, Venn diagram, senior leadership of my firm, Rush Limbaugh listeners. I'm going to be OK. <laughs> and of course, you know, I was OK for a while. Um, a lot of people attacked the piece. I wrote a follow-up called The Restatement on Flight 93, right. which is included. The one thing, by the way, I regret about this book, which I only thought of, of course, in my you know, great genius and foresight is, why didn't I include the original piece that got this whole kicked off in the first place? But I didn't. And by the time I thought of it, 
It was way, too late. Way too late. The printer. You, you'd, the printers, spent, you'd spent too much time explaining your student. The, the printers had run. Um, so I ended up in the Trump administration. I was there for about 14 months. I've been here uh, since I left the Trump administration. And it was Roger Kimball, the publisher of Encounter Books, the editor of the New Criterion, who came to me and said, I love that essay. I want to republish it. And I said, OK, I'd be happy to do that. But if you're going to republish it, then we should do the restatement, too, which I, I kind of always like better in a, in a way, but leave that out. And he says, and you have to add some new material at the front. I thought, well, that's actually a good opportunity because the, the criticisms that I address in the restatement, which was published only eight days after the Flight 93 election, were all the criticisms that came in the sort of immediate online right. um, so let's, let's, let's do a, 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 a brief yeah. uh, statement of what the original essay was, because I think the context of it and what you were trying to do is important. Um, and and uh, this, this is for how it starts. Uh, 2016 is a Flight 93 election. Charge the cockpit or you die. You may die anyway. You or the leader of your party may make it into the cockpit and not know how to fly or land the plane. There are no guarantees, except one. If you don't try, death is certain. To compound, the meta to compound the metaphor, a Hillary Clinton presidency is Russian roulette with a semi-auto. With Trump, at least you can spin the cylinder and take your chances. Um, what, 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 what was your, I mean, there's, a, there's an ur clearly an urgency to your essay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> shall we say. Um, what was the point you wanted to make? Uh, you need to vote for this man, or, or we're going to lose everything. No, and I, I, and I, no, I really didn't. Well, there's, there's, there's clearly the binary choice yeah. argument, but there's there's a deeper sense. There's more at stake here than just this election. That there was a trend that I saw going on. I mean, depending on how you want to define it, if you want to stretch it out maximally, you could say 125 years since the dawn of the original progressive era. Um, you could. Uh, Date it from the 60s, but there's a clear trend, and I want to refer to John Marini, who the last time mm -hmm. I was up on this stage, I was here with him. Um, he was definitely an inspiration for this, in in more ways than one. The sort of creeping administrative state rule had uh, eight years of Obama been followed by eight years of Hillary, and I really didn't have any doubt that it would be eight. It seemed to be preposterous to think that, with all the advantages of incumbency, with all of the structural advantages that Democratic and uh, you know, sort of big government administrative state presidencies had, it seemed idiotic to think that she might be the first president to lose a re-election campaign since 1992. So I thought we were going to get eight followed by eight, all pointing in the mm -hmm. same direction, mm -hmm. which would lead to a kind of cementing of administrative state control as far as the eye could see that traditional Republican, whether you want to capitalize the word or leave it lowercase, would not be able to overcome. But, but there, was, there was also a certain frustration, shall we say, with uh, conservatism. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the pushback against that. Uh, you, you say this in, in your new introduction. In 2016, I judged the modes and orders of my time, and especially of conservatism, to be exhausted and imprisoned with an inflexible institutional and intellectual authority. Yes. Explain what you mean by that. Uh, I guess I meant uh, a couple of things, some of them not very nice, but I don't think therefore inaccurate. Um, well, I say authority, right? So on one level, conservatism had become about a policy, which doesn't sound crazy. I mean, why shouldn't it be? But it became solely about policy. So it began to see policies that it always seemed to me to be means to ends. It began to see them as ends. Right. And, and you know, one of the ways that I found myself set apart or uh, alienated or whatever you want to say was I thought, well, I learned all this great stuff uh, from my teachers, our teachers, and from the books that we studied. And I actually haven't repudiated any of that. I don't actually think any of that is wrong. I think it's being misapplied right now. So what I saw was a conservatism that said, well, if you understand the founding in a certain way, and you understand the Federalist or Locke or Aristotle in a certain way, then you must be for this set of policies and nothing can ever change. And Trump is bad because he questions free trade, he wants to secure the border, and he, and he, want, he worries about the uh, impacts of continued immigration, mass immigration, illegal immigration. And he really wonders, you know, he's really harsh on dumb foreign policy, or, or when he right. went the direction. And I thought, <coughs> excuse me. So conservatism would say, we trace all that to these basic first principles, and if you agree with us, you're, you're a bad person and you're not conservative. And I thought, I can question everything you just said without 
stepping one millimeter off of the same continent, intellectual continent that I've been on my whole life. So some, one of us has got right. it wrong. Right. Either you don't understand this stuff the right way or I don't. And I don't think it's me, but even if it is, um, you know, we should, we should have an argument about it. Uh, and I, I, I believe that to this day. I mean, I've, I've heard lots of conservatives say, oh, you know, you guys, meaning, you know, you people who study the founding, who study Lincoln, who study political philosophy, you've gone totally astray because if you were true to your principles, you couldn't possibly support Trump. Uh, I didn't agree with that then, and I certainly don't agree with that now. Yeah, that was it, part of it. Uh, yeah, there, there's some way in which, though, I mean, our, our teachers, Harry Jaff in particular, always argued and pointed out that there was something intellectually about modern conservatism that wasn't quite right, which we can get more into. Um, but of, of late, it's, there's a way in which the 2016 election kind of pulled back a curtain, if you will, and showed that it's also very kind of doctrinal and, and stiff and incapable of making yeah. arguments. Well, look, I identified, I don't think this is particularly insightful, but I identified early on, you know, Trump's big three were immigration, trade, and foreign policy, or war. Um, immigration was where I first began to make my break with traditional conservatism, and I saw the Republican Party and the think tanks, for lack of a better term, drift more and more into an inflexible kind of chamber of commerce position. Um, trade was harder for me because I had never really studied it. Uh, I just took for granted the conservative position that free trade is better because it produces more and comparative advantage, and you've heard all the arguments. Um, Trump forced, so my initial reaction to Trump was, well, he's bad on trade, but he's good on immigration. And then my, my other, the, on, as to the third, you know, I was in the Bush administration, the, the second Bush administration, 43, and I was around for a, Afghanistan and Iraq. And actually, you know, didn't have anything to do with policy, really, but I helped make a public case for those things, and I watched them not work the way that public case said that they would. And so, it, you know, beginning in sort of the mid and certainly by the late 2000s, I had come to a point where I had to just say forthrightly, this was a mistake. We blew it. You know, America made a mistake. The Bush administration made a mistake. And conservatism, or at least a large part of it, hardened itself into a kind of defensive position where any questioning of the wisdom of the Iraq war was unacceptable and was supposed to make you unelectable. It was supposed to be, you know, make you a cat, a, 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 uh, what am I, what's the, the Greek word I'm looking for? Uh, ostracized, right. a self-ostracized from the Republican Party. And meanwhile, Trump attacks it forthrightly against essentially, let's say, 15 candidates who wanted to defend, well, no, Paul didn't. And Cruz was swoop <laughs> one, but everybody else says, no, this is a sacrosanct Republican position. You can't be against it. You know, how many times did we see in the 2015-16 cycle? I'm over and over again, someone would say, he's finally done it now. Well, that's it. He said that. It's, right. it's over. Right. He's done. He's toast. He can't win the nomination now. Over and over. But that was one of the, the bases for it was, oh, in the South Carolina primary, he came out against the Iraq war. Well, that's the end for him. And instead, it boosted him. So I, I was, I was uh, very receptive to that. The one that I held back on was trade because I hadn't thought about it. And mm -hmm. I always thought that the Republican argument was the right argument or the think tank argument was the right argument. So instead, what I did one night, um, Stayed up very late. I can't believe I got to work the next day, but I think I did. Uh, just reading um, three, three things. I mean, I didn't read the whole books, but I looked in the index and the passages. I read Smith, I read Ricardo, and I went back to the politics. And I looked for some place where it was said that uh, free trade is a moral principle or that there's some aspect of virtue or the good that's involved, not merely an instrumental or a means to prosperity. Could find nothing. And in fact, could find many instances of Smith saying the opposite, right. talking about the virtues of it uh, in societies or in economies that are roughly equal, but you know, uh, always saying you have to put the national interest first and things like this. And, I, and that, that just, can, you know, I, I thought to myself when I kind of got up the next day and went to work and had a pot of coffee, I thought, I learned something from Donald Trump. Wow, right? right. He was right and I was wrong and he right. forced me to go think it through. And so now, like, now what do you do? I mean, then it, after that it becomes impossible to take seriously the notion that he's just a TV star, that there's, he's not serious, that he has no ideas. And that kind of opened a lot of doors for me personally there. Right, okay. Um, so um, you're, of your critics, of which there were lots, some, <laughs> um, one of the criticisms was that the original essay was, um, uh, didn't make a positive argument. Yeah. 
uh, as, you, as you point out, all, all, all nightmare and no dream. Yeah. Um, I mean, it made a, I, look, I will defend myself on that to this extent. It made a positive argument. Is it does say it's better not to step off a cliff than to step off a cliff. <laughs> now, that's not the most positive <laughs> argument one can make. One can talk about what it's one. It's a relative positive What argument. one builds at the top of the cliff, and I didn't do that. But it, it's not because I didn't have that. I just, it was a, it was an exhortation in a right, moment. Right, right, no, I understood. Two weeks, or sorry, two months before an election, and I was telling people, you know, this is what I think the stakes are. I, I will note, too, that people talked about it, you know, there was a lot of criticism that it was very dark, and that it was, uh, it, it was exhorting people to do dangerous, reckless things, uh, to which I said, and we'll say again, and I think I've said more than once in the, in the book, like, really, the dangerous, reckless, crazy, psycho thing I'm telling everybody to do is, well, wait, wait, we have to have a dramatic pause. Vote. <laughs> And this from, you know, the, right, I'm right. supposed to be anti-democratic and authoritarian. But what all I'm saying to you is, vote. <laughs> now, I am telling you I think you ought to vote one way rather than the other way. Um, but every, all political journalism in a democracy does that, right? Or all right, of opinion course. journalism right, right, of course. does that. Um, but one of the reasons why you added this pre-statement, because I remember we talked about it when you were working on yeah. it, and at length we made this pre-statement was to kind of somewhat fill that void. Yeah. And you made it a pre-statement as opposed to a postscript, because really these are ideas that pre, yeah. you know, predate in actuality um, the the later statement. Right. Um, and so I, I, I want to walk through that somewhat. It's yeah. it's um, majority two. A lot of it is about what you call the American solution. Yeah. And then the other chunk of it is really about the increasing radicalization and your concerns about uh, the left and liberalism. Um, so let's do the first thing It has nine, first. well, uh, there's a little beginning and then it has nine sections, as I recall. Um, I put it first, I use this fancy phrase just to try to fool people into thinking I'm smart. I said because of its ontological priority, right, right. Uh, which I don't think I used inaccurately, but it is kind of, you know, it's just kind of a term. To well, it, 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 does, it does start with a section on political and moral epistemology. Right. So but now I, That sounds very highfalutin. I, I got a little criticism for that. People were like, nobody cares about this. Get to the point. I said, no, this is actually important. And it's a, not a long section. Um, and it's important because part of the reason I think not just conservatism but all um, political thought itself got into a ditch is because we've forgotten the simple answers to the question of how do we know what we think we know about political and moral things, Right. And I recapitulate this theme later on when I talk about mm -hmm. progressivism and the dominance of modern science, right? Modern science can't answer any of those questions. It can't tell you why the good is the good. It can't tell you why liberty is better than slavery. It can't tell you, you know, why morality is better than immorality. It can't even establish for you that morality exists. That can only be established dialectically right, right. on the basis of a, a kind of classical understanding of human nature and the virtues. And so in a, I try to do this in the simplest, shortest way possible. And I do say at the beginning of the pre-statement that you know, this is not a philosophic treatise. You can't walk away from this book and think, well, I learned the great tradition, right? The only way to learn the great tradition is you gotta just sit down and spend years reading To, the to go to Hillsdale. Yeah, you go to Hillsdale. <laughs> go to Hillsdale for undergrad and then go on to grad school. And, and by the time you're done with that, you probably have learned the great tradition. So, but, but, you, but you do point out at the very beginning that, um, uh, in short, everyone needs a theory of justice. The yeah. left has one, the right thinks it has one, but it doesn't. Right. The right so there is a connection here to this, right. uh, this immediate question. The right substituted its theory of justice, or it allowed policy to become its theory of justice, and then it forgot the underlying theory. So I first try to say, look, moral and polit political epistemology is how, how do we know what we know? How do we know what we think we know about morality? Because you can't see it, you can't measure it. You, you know, and the electron microscope or any aspect of the scientific method is of no use in this. But my point is, you don't need any of that. Okay. You can still know moral things without any of that. And it's not as complicated as we've made it out to be. And then I move on to, uh, 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 I forgot the way I titled it. With um, this, the yeah. human nature, human, your life, your life and, and the, the good, good life. Right, so the, the, first we can establish how we think we know what we know about morality. Then we have to ask, you know, what is the content of morality, or of, of political morality and personal morality, right? So mere life and the good life, you have to have both, but you also have to make the distinction. Um, mere life on its own, in other words, just survival, uh, I think any moral thinker, ancient or modern, religious or right. secular, would say is insufficient, right? You, you, mere life 
is, requ is required for the good life, but it doesn't, it is not itself the good life, and it on itself without the good life, there's something kind of debased about it. Right. It's not what human beings are supposed and, to do. And, and even begin going down this path, would take, which takes uh, more, uh, is to recognize the, how we bereft our current political conversation is of those various terms. I mean, the, the left has its own theory of justice, light, largely because they've given up on all that, and it's just yeah. whatever the next darn thing is. Um, but the conservatives, they don't take any of those things seriously. Well, I think they think they know, but they don't really know. And worse, I think they don't know that they don't know. So the third section I do remember is uh, called the American Solution. It's right, to yeah. say the political problem, in a sense, is how do you come up with a political solution in a given circumstance for a given people that both promotes mere life and promotes the good life? with the understanding that government can't deliver the good life, right? And if you're asking government to deliver the good life, you're at, it's a, that's a, essentially a utopian project that can't be realized. What it can do is create conditions for it. It can help it. It can right. help encourage it, help it flourish. But it ha it, government has to be a sort of mixture of activism and pacifism that will always differ with the circumstances. But if you're asking it to say, well, you're just simply going to deliver or create this, you're going to be let down every time, or much worse, the government's just going to do all kinds of things that it shouldn't be doing. It'll become tyrannical. So how do the, you know, this is a perennial problem. You can solve it one way in the ancient world. You could solve it another way in the medieval world, depending on where you are, what, you know, what circumstances you're dealing with. How did the American founders right, solve right. it? And I lay that out, yeah, it, um, I think, in a fairly succinct form. It's uh, a lot of that is taken from a review that I wrote of Tom West, a Hillsdale professor, I, I note, uh, his book called The Political Theory of the American Founding, which came out in October of 2017. Uh, I reviewed the book very enthusiastically because I love it. I even love West. Right. As, unlovable, <laughs> as part of that as is. As unlovable <laughs> as he tries to be, I love it. Of anyway. course, this is off the record, so he wouldn't totally, hear that. Um, but, uh, and then uh, the, sec the, the section following that is called The Scope and Limits. Now, this is really important. Yeah, uh, Go, go ahead. No, that, that, I want to get into this in some extent because this the, is important for the conservatives. Because in, and I, in a way, I have to blame. Maybe I'll blame only myself, but I, I'm I'm implicitly blaming some other people from my school. But I won't name any of them. Right? We made we 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 contributed to this problem in that we taught a version of the truth of what the founders believed and what Abraham Lincoln believed, and we made it easy for people to say, oh. I went and I took a one-week seminar and I read the Declaration of Independence and I read the Gettysburg Address and I read certain And I figured it all and out. And I, I know what it means and that's all there is to it. And so, you know. And so we should go back and advocate tax cuts. Right. And I thought, no, it's more complicated than that. And in fact, you know, the American solution, as beautiful as it is, as true as it is, has, is subject to practical limits. And I, I try to lay right. out what those right. are Which, in right. that section. Um, and, and which is inherent in the project itself, yeah. and that's, that's part of the understanding. Okay, so the, the first one you have is men are equal only in possessing equ equally the same natural rights. Right. So this is, a, this is a common criticism. I don't know how common it is, but it's at least out there uh, that, well, you know, that particular school, I mean, look, we're, in, we're at Hillsdale College right now. We're in a room with the founding documents up above us is a, I don't, I don't know if that's a, I don't, it is the Constitution, right. okay, but it would have been in the same room, so it could be either one, except that George Washington is there and he would not have been there for the Declaration of Independence because uh, he was out in the field, right? So people say, well, I learned this, I sort of learned what the, the principle is, and I learned what equality is, and so the, the, there's a, a, a left-wing critique of that which says, oh, you promised equality and we haven't delivered it, there's still poverty, there's inequality and all of this, therefore, you're either a hypocrite or you, America's either hip, hypocritical or it's a failure. Right. And there's a right-wing critique of that which says um, equality is sort of obviously not true. Only a delusional fool could believe in it. Therefore, America's flawed from the beginning. Or the corollary to that is, ah, they didn't really mean equal. They just right. meant right. Right. rights of Englishmen or some qualified... Or, or you want to downplay it, it so much because it's such a dangerous idea. Right. Yeah. And right. to which I say, look, both of you guys, both sides on that debate are wrong. Right? Uh, equality has a very specific meaning for the founders. It doesn't mean leveling. It doesn't mean the denial of differences in talent and virtue and so on among individual human beings. It knows that those things are going to be um, unevenly distributed across a population. It also knows that uh, a regime that secures equal natural rights will result in natural inequality as differences in talent 
are able to uh, acquire more or less and rise to a greater or lesser degree. It knows that. So we have to get equality right if we're going to understand the founding and understand this solution properly. Um, any social compact, and hence any political community, is inherently particular. Yes. So things between universals and particulars. Um, a universal is a, well, in politics, a universal is a law or a principle that applies to all, uh, at least in theory, but it doesn't necessarily mean it can be applied to all in practice. So the most highfalutin political regime ever conceived by the human mind is the city and speech of Plato's Republic, right? Uh, but it makes a distinction between citizen and non-citizen. It says there's going to be a border, and there's going to be, I'm sorry to be blunt, but this is the Greek term, uh, there's going to be friends and there's going to be enemies. So be, uh, another criticism, again, you get this from the left and the right, same metaphysical basis but for a different outcome. The left will say, if you're serious about your principles, then you can't have any borders, and this has to apply to everybody, and you know, everybody should be able to do it. It's universal. And the right would say, well, if you're serious about your principles, um, you, you, then it, you're a hypocrite if you establish any kind of border or establish social compact, which means you're not really serious about your principles and you admit the fact that all human society is particular and based on a right, right. kind of tradition and, and the universal principles. C.1, we didn't really mean it. Yeah, right. we didn't really mean it. Um, or, or maybe, no, but it, sometimes some people on the right, to our right, I would say, say it as they didn't really mean it. Or sometimes they say they meant it, but they were just idiots. They right. didn't really know, to, they didn't realize how dumb they were and how bad this principle was, and so America's flawed from the beginning. The form must fit the matter. Yeah. Um, I mean, this is one of the more tricky ones to talk about. It gets people uh, upset. But, you know, the founders were uh, pretty blunt about this point in their time. They said, look, we're establishing a republic here because we think it's going to work in the peculiar context of right. people here. we find ourselves right. with. Uh, and think back to that. I mean, this is a people that had been essentially self-governing for more than 150 years. You didn't get daily social media <laughs> cues from London every day saying, right. do this, do that. You couldn't even have a telegraph. Sailing packets would come every once in a while. You'd have some instructions. Benign neglect. You'd send a governor over, a governor general over. They would try to do their best to rule you, but they were a tenuous contact. I, I, you know, from hard experience, the American people had to learn how to be self-governing over the course of well over a century. They had to fight a war, oh, not alone. They had British right. support, but almost by themselves. And so it, it they, was, it was, they were the French. And, and remember the. Yeah. <laughs> And remember, it the only, it, it only goes so far. The Americans are looking at a European continent in which liberty is far from the norm. Right. In which, to the extent that it exists, I mean, Federalist One through Six is, is sort of. I, I find it. I love it. It's interesting to me. But you know, I am a doom. I'm a gloomy sort of person. It's dreary in the sense they look at it and they, you know, they talk about the um, uh, experience of liberty on the European continent in their time and over the past couple of hundred years, and they say all of that suggests that we're going to fail. <laughs> Nobody's been able to get this right since the ancient world. So if even the most civilized countries in the world, uh, in, you know, such as France, the most, at their time, most civilized and advanced countries in the world, they don't, they, they, the founders think they're not practicing liberty, nor could they. they. They certainly don't think that, let me put it this way, um, Tom Paine, you know, the famous comment in uh, uh, Common Sense, where he talks about how, you know, despotism had once revolved from east to west, now the principles of liberty with the same rapidity are revolving from but, west to east. Was, that was not a widespread sentiment among the founders. Right. That was Paine's sort of right. vainglorious self-assertion. I think most of them would have said to Paine, listen, we, we appreciate your enthusiasm in the particular case, but the idea that this notion is just going to sweep the world and everything is going to be uh, governed according to Republican principles within a couple of decades is, is, is a fantasy. Right, right. And that's a principle going back to, I mean, the, to yeah. starting with Aristotle. Yeah. You look at where you're at, and that has, clearly has lots of implications for how we look at the world today. And right. Well, look, it, I mean, it East. certainly helps explain, yes, the failure of the Iraq War right. and the failure right. of that, 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 that whole project. Um, Republican government requires a measure of commonality in customs, habits, and opinions. Yes. Uh, I think this is sort of unquestionable. Uh, I don't think the founders would have disagreed with that at all. I don't think Abraham Lincoln would have disagreed with that it's, at all. I think that's something on which Hamilton and Jefferson, who disagreed almost everything, would, would agree on that yeah. wholeheartedly. But we've tended to forget it in our time, or if not forget it, we get angry at people who assert it, and you know, we shout at them for saying, you're a bad person for bringing that up. But look, America, um, I got into this, I went to, um, I went and gave a talk at Princeton last week, eight, uh, 
Wednesday. Um, and survived to tell the I story. I survived fine. But the, 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 among the hostile questions, people thought, well, oh, I've got you now. Um, one of them was, you know, well, you're worried about, uh, you know, you're worried about precisely that question. And uh, I was talking about the, the talk was about nationalism and why it's reasserting itself in Europe and to, to a lesser extent in America. And uh, brought up some thought like that. And I said, look, I guess the question was, well, what's the difference between the American nationalist experience and the European nationalist experience? I said, well, there's commonality and then there, and then there are differences. Um, one of the differences is that uh, the American nation has been better, I think, I think this is actually not really arguable, than any nation in the history of the world at taking peoples from various different traditions, backgrounds, cultures, languages, and so on, and assimilating them and making them American and making them small or Republican. It has been better at that than any than any country I know of ever in any circumstance. Doesn't mean its capacity is, is completely unlimited. I think we found the limit of it a while ago. Mm. Um, and right now we're struggling with it. I don't know that we found a permanent limit, but we certainly found a limit right. that we're bumping up against now. We're struggling with it. And a candidate like Donald Trump comes along and says, this is an issue and we need to prioritize the needs of our current citizens. And he shouted at partly by people. Hey, one of the things I've, I didn't maybe point out as, as vividly or as bluntly as I could have, and I kind of wish I had now, is how the left really contradicts itself on this point. On the one hand, the left really Sometimes hates, you just don't tell us what you think. The left really hates the founding principles, you know, dead white males and so on, and just wants to trash them left. Well, okay, so let's, so let's, let's go into But, but the, on the other the, hand, they, they will say, they will defend kind of an undefended border and, right. uh, and, and high immigration levels on a kind of argument that they derive from what they think are the founding principles. So, so let's, let's go into the, then the, really the second part of, of the book here and spend some t a little time on this. You have several sections that go into yeah. kind of this shift towards a more radical liberalism, but you, you do it through various sections that lay out yeah. the, the, some historical liberalism and then its changes. Um, especially as you go into post '60s leftism. Right. So before we get to lay that, that out, I, I have the, the section following scope and limits is called American attack attacks on the, on the American solution. Right. And it lays out sort of three primarily American criticisms of what the founders and Lincoln and his heirs were trying to do. I would say up through that section, right. Um, all of us, meaning us, we and our friends, so Masugi, Elmers, and some others in this room. If 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 if, if it, you guys find anything to disagree with in those first five sections, well, I blew you. it, I blew it. You should agree with all of that. And it starts to become more, more me in my you know, gloominess and hysterical despair after that. And then you're free to disagree with all of that and go, ah, oh, it's just Anton going crazy. Um, so the American attacks on the American solution, it begins with capital P progressivism and how they went after the Constitution and the constitutional order root and branch. Actually, no, it doesn't Well, yeah, the pre-Civil pre War. You, you go and go, actually, sorry, you're right. It doesn't go, that's the second, that's the second wave. The, um, the first wave is the pre-Civil War wave, which has to attack uh, the principles of the Declaration for obvious reasons, and comes up with the theory of group uh, rights. Introduces group rights. Which becomes dormant and then picked up later. So uh, we move then to capital P progressivism, right. which is the second wave, um, which attacks the founding, kind of on the basis of science and expertise, we went into this at a great length. A new account of human nature. Right, when Marini was here, this, right. is, this is something I learned from him more than from anyone. I would, the other person I would name was R.J. Pastrito, who's also a professor at Hillsdale and the dean of the graduate school. Um, and the third wave is what I call post-1960s liberalism. And it's a kind of amalgamation of Rawls, John Rawls wrote a book, a famous book. I don't recommend reading it, it's really hard to read. but. It's out there and it's influential, called A Theory of Justice, 1971. Right. And sort of new left radicalism. Yeah, yeah, so these, be, these emerge at the same time, but they're, they're on different tracks, but eventually they. And when they kind of come to, they at do. odds with each other at some point. They, they, they are, but they, um, they are reconciled, but on new left terms. Right. Every, t every time there's a contradiction or tension between the two, uh, Rawls always has to defer and give way. <laughs> it, it never works the other way. Having said that, uh, this is modern le the leftism's um, theories of justice. Mm -hmm. right? Rawls is a theory of justice, and the other is a social justice. Yeah. Social justice is, I think, just a kind of pop culture term for the merge of Rawls and the new left. I mean, the new left, look, uh, uh, part of my... I was going to say intellectual. I don't know how intellectual it is. But anyway, part of my... I grew up in Northern California... Uh, amongst a bunch of hippies, weirdos, leftists, and crazy people. 
And I went to Berkeley, which is filled with the same type of people. My hometown is Santa Cruz, which is the same type of people. Everything you know, I've known is that kind of people. And uh, a very influential book on me, uh, I think I read in 1988, uh, was Destructive Generation by Coll Peter Collier and David Horowitz. And these guys were two really hard, like not liberals. I mean, these were hard radicals hanging around with people, you know, bombing police stations and killing cops and that kind of thing, crazy radicals. And who then had second thoughts later and said, mm. gee, maybe we were involved in evil and should repent. And they did repent, <laughs> good for them. Uh, and they wrote a great book uh, about not just all the stuff that they personally saw, but that kind of encapsulated that whole ethos. Um, a lot of it focused on Northern California haunts that I was familiar with. Um, and that had a real impact on me, and it's kind of stayed with me over the years, maybe because it was near. So when I see the left, the more I see the left going crazy right. today, in recent years, it, like, it reminds me of those echoes from my childhood and from that book and that kind of thing. Um, that, that I don't think when the new left started doing what it was doing, it really had a theory. I think it was just right, id, right. just angry id. So that's where I was just kind of yeah. going to go. I mean, there's, there's something about the, the, the you know, left in its current forms. Um, it's not merely kind of a spinning out of the yeah. emptiness of the progressives, right? And the progressives, in hindsight, uh, had some really bad ideas. They, they, they had set right. down some roots. Um, but the, the, the new left seems really different, both intellectually yeah, it's and much more, what it's actually doing. It's, it's um, nihilistic, for lack of a better term. Except, I mean, a real nihilist would say, well, I'm nihilistic because you remember our old teacher, Harry Newman. Right, Harry called Newman. Him, we had a teacher who called himself a nihilist. He, I mean, he, he went to work every day. He lived to be like 95. And How are you a, doing? Had a very 50 50. 50, 50. <laughs> he, had a, he lived a very orderly life. And I remember I asked him, I thought I, thought I was very clever. I was probably about 25. And I said, Professor Newman, you're, you know, I, know, I know now that you're a fraud and a hypocrite. So, well, why, why would you say that? And I said, because you always say you're a nihilist. But, you know, I see you, you go and you buy your lunch at the same place every day. You go to campus, you always show up for work on time. You never miss a day. You live this totally orderly life. You pay your mortgage, you do this. You're like, I mean, that's not a nihilist, you're bourgeois. That's, that's, you don't get it at all. So what don't I get? He said, nihilist means there is nothing. I can, I can choose to live any way I want. This is how I want to live. I was like, dang, he got me. <laughs> uh, so, 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 but, the, but they're not nihilist in the sense that they're empty. Yeah, they're not nihilist uh, in the sense they're, 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 they're nihilist. They're nihilist they realize there's nothing and we're going to take over. But they don't actually, I used to believe that. They don't believe there's nothing. I, they're not moral relativists. I used to think that, and I don't anymore. Um, they have a theory of justice, and this is really kind of the most radical part of the book. I don't think it's inaccurate, but it is kind of radical. I really do think they're motivated by uh, a desire. The nice way to put it would be redress. Mm -hmm. uh, the not nice way to put it would be revenge. Um, they think that the entire ledger of human affairs is a sort of one of um, uh, uh, victim and victimizer, uh, sin and sinned against. They think that this is hereditary. They think that uh, the purpose of justice is to even out the ledger, and they're going to do it. And I think that that is, you know, I, I wrote this before the Kavanaugh hearing. I wrote this before a lot of the craziness that we've seen go on in the last, say, six months. I wrote this before no fewer than four presidential candidates came out and said that they're for reparations. And uh, it seems to all be going in the direction that I feared it would. Right, right. Um, so you, you can, uh, in your ending, you talk about a fundamental choice we still face and uh, write that the most sinister feature of the post-1960s leftism, the one that feeds all the others, is the spiritual sickness, the self-loathing, and existential despair with which it has infected the formerly confident and capable West. Yes. Uh, talk, tell us about that some, and then, and then we'll open up to questions. I think that, they, that the left has managed based on what I was talking about a moment ago, their, their insistence on seeing all of justice and injustice as a kind of historical ledger. You either belong to an oppressor group or you belong to a victim group. And it doesn't matter if um, you personally never oppressed anybody or you personally will ne were never oppressed. Although they will, they, will, they will deny that. They will say, well, what do you mean? I mean, you say I was never oppressed. And I could say, well, yeah, you've never you know, suffered X or Y or Z. So this is why they have to right, come up right. with Concepts like privilege and you know institutional. I remember so another one of my great heroes is uh, Tom Wolf, who died I don't know last year, May of last year, uh, and he, he he told a story about being on a 
panel, I think it was at Princeton, but anyway, at some elite university in the 60s. And uh, the phrase he used was the great adjectival catch-up, which I'll explain briefly. So he's on this panel, and it's three like far leftists, you know, I don't know, Mark I forgot who. Mark Cusa, I think, was one of them. And, he, and, you know, and they all give this talk about how everything is going down the tubes and we're all about to die. And, and Wolf finally just loses it and says, oh, Michael Harrington was one of them. Uh, you know, I don't understand what you're talking about. We're in the middle of a happiness explosion. So he's, this is like 67 or 68. Now, it sounds like these are troubled times, right? But actually, the experience of being alive then was you're still in the middle of this giant economic boom that barely stops mm -hmm. in the end of the first, Second World War. Um, you're, you know, people have freedom that they haven't had pretty much ever in the history of the world. And they're using it, which is Wolf dedicated his career, or part of his career, to describing. They're using that freedom to just invent kind of new lifestyles and new forms and all kinds of kooky ways to enjoy themselves. And the great adjectival catch-up is, you know, when people say, well, you know, Michael Harrington talks about poverty, uh, you know, an economist could easily say, well, we're looking at the numbers and actually it's, people really are much less impoverished than they've basically ever been since human beings ever. left the Garden of Eden. Right. So and then, well, we have to add an adjective. Well, we're talking about relative poverty, you know. And so for every kind of pathology they wanted to name, it had manifestly gotten better, they would come up with some epicycle theory to say, well, yeah, it kind of looks that way. But in fact, it's really bad because of... Our left does that too. So right. you can't, you know, you could find a person and you'd say, well, you haven't been oppressed in this way or this way or this way. All the concrete ways that I can think of where oppression really manifests itself. But they still want to say they're oppressed. So they come up with some theory about how, in fact, despite the fact that I'm a tenured professor in an Ivy League university and you know, I make $200,000 a year and I'm on the lecture circuit and all this, I'm still oppressed because of, you know, all this nonsense that we hear. Right. Um, so, much and, the, and, so much for the Leave Us Alone Coalition. And the, but the point is, getting back to the question you asked specifically, uh, they've gotten everybody else to buy it. Right. We buy it. And even if we don't really believe it, we pretend like we do because we don't want to get yelled at. So when you hear somebody who's so odd, like, I mean, I'm sorry, like Jesse Smollett, you make a lot of money, you're on a hit TV show, you know, you're a celebrity in so many ways, like, right. in what way are you at a, any kind of a disadvantage in American society in 2019? None that I can really think of. Um, he might say, well, I'm, because I'm a minority and because I'm gay and this and that, but like, when was the last time American society really actively discriminated against anybody for either one of those categories, as opposed to the elite culture celebrating that? It's been a while, right? But he still wants to say, I'm oppressed, I'm a victim somehow. And I think there are a whole bunch of people, I know I'm willing to raise my hand and say it, I find that preposterous. There's a lot of other people who just believe it, that's what I mean by the lack of confidence. And then there's a whole lot of other people who kind of find it preposterous but know that if I raise my hand and say I find that preposterous, the hand's gonna come off, so I'm just right. gonna go. Right, right, and they'll go back in their yeah. little communities. Let's take some questions. Uh, right back here. Yeah, wait for the microphone, please, if you would. Yeah, wait for the microphone. Okay, what you've identified as the new left is intersectional progressivism, as first postulated by Bell Hooks. Uh, I thought that this was a 2019 update of the Flight 93 essay, and I just want to uh, prep my question with the following. You're going to stick to a question, though. Correct? Yes, oh, yes. Without a doubt, the biggest change since 2016 is the mass deplatforming of those who oppose the intersectional left you identified as the sort of Rawls new yeah. left. Uh, so not just on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, Reddit, et cetera, but PayPal, Stripe, Airbnb, YouTube, Lyft, you name it. Uh, we are in these sort of great platform wars. Your own essay was published uh, with under a pseudonym, and that is the principal mode of publication for many on social media who fear for their own yeah. uh, names. So what is your proposal for increasing the distribution channels for your ideas, given that the principal change since 2016 is the dramatic cuts to distribution of anything against the intersectional left? I wish I had a proposal. Um, I don't. I, you know, I agree it's a problem. I support and try to help in every way I can all the people fighting that problem. Uh, you know, my own... You've got a job. Yeah. Who I, I do, I do now. I mean, you, you have, at your you have more job security. Um, it, it, I, I guess when I think about these kinds of things, you know, my solutions tend toward the radical. They may be impractical, or, uh, but you know, take a hammer to it. Like I, I actually, I, there's almost nothing about Elizabeth Warren that I'm particularly in love with or support, but when she says break up the big three tech firms, 
I almost vote for her just on that alone. I don't see what good it does to free thought, free expression, uh, to have dis, you know to have 93 percent of the book market in control of Amazon, and to have you know uh, the overwhelming amount of public discourse in control of uh, Facebook, Twitter, and Google. I just I I think that's not what the founders had in mind, and it's not good for the human mind. It's not good for civilization. And you know, if Teddy Roosevelt were around. Uh, if some of the trust busters were around from the turn of the last century, I think they'd be wondering, well, what, what's taking us so long? Uh, right here? Wait for the, where's the mic? Okay, right here. Oh, that's, we'll go right there first. Go ahead. Go ahead. Quick question. Uh, after you said you'd first heard a succinct statement of Donald Trump's position on free trade, you said you went back uh, at night, you went back to your place, and you'd re you took all night reading three different publications. What were those again? They weren't. I didn't read them all because they're long. But I read sections of um, Adam Smith. Adam Smith. So, but the Wealth of Nations, not theory of moral sentiments. Uh, Ricardo, whose book I can't even remember what the title of it is, but it's the one on comparative advantage. Right. Uh, and Aristotle's Politics. Okay, go ahead. Um, I'll see if I can, uh, 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 if you can clarify this. Uh, Certainly, the uh, uh, people uh, back in the period of, of framing the Constitution and such were under the influence of a lot of, you know, uh, classical authors, yep. uh, Plutarch, just to take one. And the, uh, within those sort of moralistic writings coming from the classical world, there was this definite line of thinking that when, this, when a society becomes t uh, corrupt, right, you know, right through the fabric of the society, then basically the country that you're talking about is going to go downhill. It's whatever power it has, it's going to lose. Um, there actually was a, a, a very influential 19th century figure who questioned that. He said, actually, that makes great moral reading uh, edification, but you, you can show many examples of totally corrupt societies, which at least as far as the country went, didn't lose its power you know, it may have been horrible for the people living there. So, so where do you come down on this? Because you certainly so, point out the corruption. Well, I'm a, so does that mean we're going to go down? I make or no flying theory. Are, I make we, no, are we a I make corrupt no, society? I make no predictions. Um, but I'm a believer in the classical conception of the cycle of regimes. It seems to me to be uh, uh, pretty airtight in theory and borne out by historical experience. I'm working on... A, 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 major, I don't know if it's major, but anyway, it'll be long, uh, study of Montesquieu's uh, considerations on the greatness of the Romans and their decline, which I call, my subtitle is A Case Study on the Cycle of Regimes. I think that's what that book essentially is. So that, that's a law of nature that will never be repealed. Where the United States may or may not be in the cycle is something we can all think about and question. I, I do think we shouldn't be complacent right now. I don't think we should just, you know, I, I love Ronald Reagan in so many ways. Um, but I think it would be naive at this moment to take for granted one of his favorite catchphrases that you know America's best days are yet to be. That's us, not to say that they necessarily aren't, but if they're going to be, we're going to need to make them be. We can't just sit back and, and hope or assume that that's going to happen. Uh, the guy, I, I picked this guy earlier, right, back, right here in the middle. Put your hand up, or higher. Hi, yes. Yeah, so uh, what do you think is going to happen with a lot of the Never Trump right people like Max Boo, Bill Crystal, do you think after the next election? Well, I think it's the real anti Trump. I think it's generous and inaccurate to call them right. So let's just say the never Trump former right or the never Trump whatevers. Um, and so the people like Boot, who, I mean, give uh, Boot's a, actually was a friend of mine once. We both went to college. We, got, we started in the same year. He's from California. Anyway, we're not anymore. Uh, um, that's more him than me. Uh, but I would say mutual. Uh, uh, now, I think, you know, somebody like Crystal and the rest of them, they think they're the right, or they like to call themselves the right. Boot is more honest. I give him credit in being more honest and saying, I've just broken with the right, and now I'm a Democrat, and I'm on the left. Uh, I think Crystal and that whole crowd's pose that they're still on the right is preposterous and unsustainable and won't last. So if you're asking what I think will happen, I think they are, and again, I'm going to have to be a little mean, but accurate, and at least still get the point across. I think they're uh, kind of minstrels for the anti-Trump mainstream media and useful as long as Trump is around and as soon as Trump is gone, all their funding and relevance so, is going to dry up and blow away. So, so is it that the, um, I mean, the, the, this Trump kind of pulls back the curtain uh, on conservatism and it turns out there's this divide um, between conservatives who don't quite know what to make of it 
and can't adjust, which includes a lot of the think tanks. But then some of these ones have become very deeply anti-Trump. But clearly there was something that predated yeah. Trump to some extent that drew it out of them. I mean, yeah. I mean, Crystal said something a long time ago. I forgot when. I mean, the, I'd have to look it up. But he said something like, "This well, was the guy who write, wrote the famous article about national greatness." Right. Uh, Bill Crystal, after all. Right. With David Brooks was co-author on right. that, who just came out for reparations last Friday. Um, <laughs> uh, he said something a while ago. I don't remember how long ago, but I think it was definitely pre-Trump. He said, "Well, look, if I had to prioritize between all the domestic things that I've wanted to see done over the years, you know, a balanced budget, a curtailing of this and that, the other thing." And war, I'd pick the war every time. So if you want a simple explanation, it's probably that. So and Trump, actually has, Trump has been less of a threat to their aggressive foreign policy than I think a lot of people thought or feared. I will put that only in, the, in this following sense. Uh, I don't think Trump ran as an isolationist. You know, I, but I think a lot of people who voted for him thought they heard that or wanted to hear that. The rhetoric of the campaign. And so every time he does something a bit aggressive on the world stage, they feel let down and betrayed. But, so how, but how do you explain, to take two magazines, for example, the direction of the Weekly Standard and its demise? National Review, on the hand, which are the ones that, that published yeah. the Never Trump cover story, uh, they still have critics, but they've adjusted to a large extent, uh, comparatively. Well, look, I, 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 I know something, I'm not maybe enough or everything. I know something about what actually happened to the Weekly Standard. It's too simplistic to say they just went away because of Trump. Yeah, wait, All kinds well, of internal Fair enough. But I mean, like but, but, and in uh, fact, they were, publishing some of the, they were publishing some really good... Very some, good people. You know, uh, but, but some interesting pro-Trump perspectives all the way till the end. Fred Barnes, they never tried to rein in. They let him do what he wanted to do, and he was always... Well, setting aside the stuff. magazines in particular, for some reason there were so, some of the critics of Trump in the election... Mm -hmm. Um, who were very strong critics, not, 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 not merely he wasn't my first choice, but they were opposed to him, um, post-election have uh, prudentially or well, practically first, first made adjustments. First of all, one thing is he's delivered, some haven't. he's delivered a lot of conservative but, priorities. But it tells us something about how they think, about, how, yeah. about the conservatives themselves. Yeah. Right? Look, I, as for, you know, I think some people just, you know, if, if you always wanted... Um, Good, you know, judges and Supreme Court justices, and you know, think about all other things in the traditional Republican uh, agenda that he's actually been able to deliver on. So that's going to mollify a lot of people. And I think the radicalization of the left probably mollifies or scares a lot of people. I think the Brett Kavanaugh experience was a wake up. I hope it was a wake up call for a lot of people. I mean, I knew I, I knew Brett Kavanaugh. I worked with him for four years when I was in the Bush White House. And uh, I like the guy. I mean, you know, I, the, but the last thing I would think, I mean, what, what do you think of when you think of Brett Kavanaugh? Um, you know, sort of drunken Viking serial rapist. Yeah, that's the first thing I think of when I think of Brett Kavanaugh. It was so completely preposterous that if you're paying attention at all, you'd think, wow, these people will stop at nothing and they will right. just steamroll totally innocent human beings for political ends. And it probably wakes you up to a little of that. Now, there's a great divide where uh, um, a lot of conservatives who said they were always for um, you know, strict constructionists, originalists, judges who are going to interpret the Constitution, um, you know, anybody who said that they were for that for the past 30 years, who couldn't stand up for Brett Kavanaugh in the face of obvious calumny, I just, you know, right, you're just written off. You're not, you're not conservative, you're not a friend, you're not an ally, you're just, you're, you are whatever you are, but you're, you're none of those things. And I don't think I can even take you seriously as someone who's even trying to be consistent with their past uh, philosophic positions. But, but that goes back to your point about conservatives becoming so doctrinal it's incapable of making practical Actually, though, Judge. it's not. I, you'd be better if they were, I mean, they would have been better had they just been doctrinal on that question. You could say, well, I'm doctrinal about constitutional interpretation. This is a good man who's going to do a good job of constitutional interpretation. The um, accusation seems pretty flimsy. And even if it's not, you know, you've got to be guilty until proven. And so, uh, they, didn't, they couldn't even do that. They just thought, well, the wind is blowing this way and from the left, and so I'm, that's where I'm going. Right, thank you for coming out tonight and addressing all these important issues. So in regards to your thoughts on the mirror versus the good life, might there be a point where the real per capita wealth or income of society could reach a point that it's morally meritable to provide every individual with the resources necessary to achieve the mere life, that then they could have that mere life without laboring, and therefore all their labor could be in pursuit of the good life? And why or why not would that be? So it sounds like the Andrew Yang platform, which is sweeping the nation. Well, it's sweeping parts of the nation. It reminds me of 
kind of a Paulite in the sense that this is, seems like a guy who's going to have a small but extremely devoted following right up until the end. I just don't know that it's going to um, win him anything except that small but devoted following. I guess what concerns me about that is, um, you know, from many books that I've read, ancient and current, right? The centrality of work to a sense of self-worth, to a sense of purpose, to a sense of being is so important that if you provide and if you provide mere life with no strings, what are you doing to the soul and to the sense of initiative that the soul requires to, you know, for lack of a better term, kind of get out of bed in the morning? And in a way, you're almost defeating the purpose because once the ends of mere life are provided externally, then life becomes, can become, at least for a lot of people, all about mere life and just the satisfaction of wants and desires. You're never looking to anything higher. So I would worry a lot. This is basically the root of my opposition to, um, what do they call it, guaranteed minimum income, GMI? But right, a, right, right. Um, but, but Charles Murray kind of had an idea about that. Charles too, Murray wrote that book ago, in 2009, right? I think, yeah. long ago. I, maybe earlier than that. Uh, and I mean, remember Replacement Charles Murray for the welfare state. Charles Murray was a uh, proposal was a grand bargain. We we right. we guarantee a minimum income, but your side rid of a bunch of we stuff. have to get rid of the entire right. welfare state, not just the transfer payments, but also all the bureaucracies and all the jobs and the gigantic apparatus. Um, you know, would that be worth doing? Maybe I still I still worry about what that does to the human soul, and I think that's that would probably want be one of those grand failed experiments that we would come to really regret. Right. Um, let's take um, right here with, with one last question, and then you can. Uh, do you think that Trumpism, so to speak, is a blip? Or do you think it's a change in conservative orthodoxy as its thing? Presumably future presidential candidates won't be quite as loud and over to overcome the megaphone, so to speak. Uh, right. uh, it's not a blip. Whether it can, you know, it's 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 um, it's weaker uh, politically in terms of its number of adherents, and certainly in terms of its predominance or visibility in the culture, right? So it's got it's stacked up against a whole bunch of disadvantages, but it's not a blip in the sense that we can go back to old republicanism, old conservatism. If if Trumpism turns out to not be viable, I think what that means, I'm sorry to say, is just that the left is just going to win. Forever, or until as long as they can sustain what they're doing, however long that is. Is it 40 years? Is it 50 years? Is it 100 years? Um, if there's going to be a viable alternative to the sort of financial, social media, managerial left that we have now, it will be Trumpism or something like it. It's not going to be traditional conservatism as we knew it. But wh where do we go from here, though? I mean, uh, Trump, one, one might say, is a disrupting figure. What, what, what does it need to be followed by to keep its success going? Uh, well, it would need to be followed by a party that is, that's basically focused on prioritizing the needs of American citizens first, which means getting this border secured, um, uh, doing trade deal, redressing trade imbalances and doing trade deals to favor American workers and reorienting our foreign policy along those lines. If the party, or another party, I mean, if the Republican Party can't get its act together, then, you know, parties die. I, I'd be sort of sad to see the party go, but I mean, how many, was Abraham Lincoln sad to see the Whig party go? You know, maybe not. If it can't do what it's supposed to do anymore, um, then maybe it should go. I'd like to see it get its act together and do what it should be done, but if it can't, I'm not gonna mourn it just because it's the Republican party and I used to vote for it. If the, at the alternative is to just be the same old Republican party with the same old agenda and just keep losing forever, then, you know, I'm, other people can cry over it, I won't. So the one thing you didn't, you didn't point out that they should do is, is read Things written by Michael Anton. I just assume they're already doing it. <laughs> so I thank you. Uh, the book is After the Flight 93 Election. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Michael Anton. Thank you.